for your blessing, God. And Lord, we just ask you, Father, we want to hear what you are saying. We want to hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. And we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 We talked last week about how the Holy Spirit was the dominant theme in the book of Acts. Not the apostles, but the Holy Spirit. How the Holy Spirit was mentioned 41 times. So today we're going to talk about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We're going to talk about what it means, how it changes your life, and why we need it. So I want you to turn to Acts chapter 2. Hold, hold, hold there in Acts. Well, no, let's go to Acts. Let me just read it. Acts chapter 2. Starting at verse 1, I'm going to read it in the King James because that's what I was raised on, and it just, I just like it in the King James. So I'm going to read this passage in the King James. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. Now when this was noised abroad... See, when the Holy Spirit fills you, when he baptizes you, it's just going to come out. Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So what happened on this day, it was not manufactured. It was not a program. It was a move of the Spirit of God that it was an overflow of the goodness of God is what it was. Upon all the people. Now, when this was noise abroad, the multitude came together. This was at the Feast of Pentecost. It was 50 days after the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Pentecost means 50 in Greek. So all these Jews were in Jerusalem to celebrate the feast. It was a Holy Spirit set up. It says they were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how we hear every man in our own tongue, wherein we were born, Parthians and Medes and Elamites and the dwellers in Mesopotamia and Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus, Asia, Phryra, Pamphlet in Egypt and in the parts of Libya around Cyrene, strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians. We do hear them speak in our tongues, the wonderful works of God. They were exalting God. Let me tell you something. When the Holy Spirit comes, man is not exalted. It's not a show. It's the point Amen. to Jesus. Amen. It's the point to his glory, to the glory of of God, not to the glory of man, not to the glory of someone's gift or their ability. No, it points to God. And they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying to one another, what meaneth this? Others mocking were saying, these men are full of new wine. Some translations say sweet wine, and sweet wine was the hard stuff. <laughs> Jews drank wine, but it was mixed with three to six parts water. So you probably weren't going to get drunk on your average wine that people drank at a wedding. That's why when Jesus turned the water into wine, nobody got drunk because the wine did not have the alcoholic content to get people drunk. See, God's not going to violate his word. But sweet wine was the, 
That was the, you know, what do they call it? Everclear, I think. That was, the, that was the stuff that could put you on your back. So they were saying, oh, oh, they're drunk. This is crazy. But Peter standing up with the 11. Now remember, Peter was the guy who denied Jesus, who when the servant girl questioned him, he caved. He couldn't even stand up to a servant girl when he was in the courtyard before Jesus was crucified. Remember the story? Oh, I know who you are. I know who you are. Oh, no, I, I, I don't know Jesus. Are you crazy? I don't know who he is. I wasn't associated with him. He couldn't even acknowledge that he walked with Jesus those three years. But yet, all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit came, baptized in the Holy Spirit, clothed with power. Peter stands up and he preaches. Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell in Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken as you suppose, seeing it is for the third hour of the day. And this is my favorite line in this passage. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in these last days. I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Visions, your old men shall dream dreams, and on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. This is that the last days, the time clock for the last days started when Peter preached that sermon. He said, This is that. We are in the last days now. And that was 2,000 years ago. But he's still coming soon. And we got to be ready because we never know. And I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood, fire, vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, the moon into blood before that great and notable day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be Save. So we entered into a new time frame now that whoever calls on the name of the Lord is going to be saved. And God is drawing people in. The first thing that we see when the Holy Spirit came is that behaviors changed. Peter was no longer ashamed of Jesus. Now remember, the church could not get started until the Holy Spirit came. Jesus said, wait until the Holy Spirit has come. Go into the upper room and wait. They waited about 10 days probably. We don't know exactly how long, but they waited about 10 days. And what happened was, their lives were transformed, and it was obvious. You cannot say that you're full of the Holy Spirit if, if, you're, if you're not a good husband. You're not allowing God to transform you. That gives no testimony. That's a bad, well, it's a bad testimony to the Lord. And we're going to see how being filled with the Holy Spirit, being truly filled with the Holy Spirit, will change your behavior. Now, Peter, he was empowered by the Holy Spirit. He began preaching. And after this, go to Acts chapter 3, the next chapter. Now, Peter and John... We're going up to the temple at the ninth hour, the hour of prayer. And that will be sometime in the evening. And a man who had been lame from his mother's womb was being carried along. And they used to sit down every day at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful. In order to beg alms of those who were entering the temple. When he saw Peter and John about to go into the temple, he began asking to receive alms. But Peter, along with John, fixed his gaze on him and said, look at us. And he began to give them his attention, expecting to receive something for them. But Peter said, I do not possess silver and gold, but what I do have, I give to you. 
in the name of Jesus Christ of the Nazarene, walk. And seizing him by his right hand, he raised him up, and immediately his feet and his ankles were strengthened. With a leap, he stood upright and began to walk, and he entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. Now notice that even though it was Peter who said, get up and walk, he wasn't praising Peter. He was praising God. See, the, whole, the move of the Holy Spirit will always point to Jesus. If it doesn't, then it's not a true move of the Holy Spirit. If it points to man, then it's not a true move of the Holy Spirit. This was the Holy Spirit working. Now, obviously, if you see somebody in a wheelchair, you better be, you better be sure it's the Holy Spirit if you jerk somebody out. We don't do things in our own strength. We don't manufacture things. We don't try to make things happen. We just flow with the Holy Spirit, and he does what he wants as he wills. Amen. We're not here for show. I'm not here for show. Let me tell you something. Every Sunday, I pray during the week. I labor over every sermon because I know that if the Holy Spirit is not empowering what I say, then it's useless. I know with my own strength, I don't have it. I don't have a photographic memory. I don't have a supreme intellect, but I know that through the power of the Holy Spirit, he can get the message across even though I may not be perfect. And that's what I rely on. It's not on my strength. And that's good because you know what? It keeps me humble. It keeps me knowing that, hey, it's not me. Amen. When I first began, began to be pastor here, dad said, son, you just remember one thing. God put you there. He knows how to keep you there. Yes, sir. I just have to flow with him. I just have to do what he tells me to do. But it's the power of a changed life. Let's look at another example that we see the power of a changed life. Turn to Acts chapter 16, verse 22. Acts chapter 16, verse 22. Now, put yourself in this position. The crowds rose up together against them. This was Paul and Silas. And the chief magistrates tore their robes off, proceeded to order them to be beaten with rods. When they had struck them with many blows, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to guard them securely. And he, having received such a command, threw them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. Now, what would you do? Somebody tore your clothes off, beat you, very painful, and threw you in prison. Your flesh would want to say, well, God, where were you? Why didn't you stop that? But what did Paul and Silas do? But about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns of praise to God and the prisoners were listening to them. Hey, maybe they sounded good. Maybe they were harmonizing. Or maybe the prisoners had nothing else to do. Wow, this is the most excitement we've had in this prison. These two guys singing and they sound horrible. Sound like a couple of hound dogs. They took... Through the power of the Holy Spirit, they took a situation that in your flesh you would say, this is horrible, and they turned it around and they began to praise God. But about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns. Remember, they were in stocks. Their backs were bloody and beaten. I'm sure they didn't have, you know, the nurse come by and put Neosporin ointment and uh, whatever else they put on it to make them feel better. But they were praying and singing hymns, praising God. I find that incredible. And the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there came a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison house were shaken. I can't imagine 
What a, what a surprise that was. Y'all remember this happened about five or six years ago. We had the earthquake in Madison. Remember that? I think I actually heard it just, just a tiny bit. But everybody was making jokes about it on Facebook. Well, this was an undeniable, sure enough, great earthquake. The foundations of the prison house were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's chains were unfastened. Wow. See, when you praise, when you respond to the Holy Spirit, it affects other people, too. Other people can be free when they see the joy and the peace that you have, when they see you treating others with kindness, when they see you not reacting in anger and not bitter, but that you're showing the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, patience, kindness, against such there is no law. See, that's the transformation of the Holy Spirit. That's what happens. And that speaks powerfully. The jailer awoke. He saw the prison doors were open. He drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried out with a loud voice saying, do not harm yourself for we are all here. And he called for lights and rushed in and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. And after he brought them out, he said, sir, what must I do to be saved? The end result of the Holy Spirit moving is to bring people into the kingdom. Because God wants people to get saved. I don't know about you, but the thought of going to hell is just the most horrible thing you could ever think of. And I don't want anybody to go there. Even my worst enemy, I wouldn't want to go there. Even that person that gets on your last nerve, you don't want to go there. Because you'll never get out. But the good news is that we don't have to go there. But it's the power of a changed life when we receive the Holy Spirit. Now, when you are saved, you receive the Holy Spirit. Turn to John chapter 20. Jesus appears to his disciples, John chapter 20, verse 22. He said, peace be unto you. The father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. So I believe they were saved at that point. When you ask Jesus into your heart, the Holy Spirit comes and he's inside of you. So everybody has the Holy Spirit. But the baptism in the Holy Spirit, it's another in filling. The word baptize in Greek means to immerse. All of a sudden what's on the inside begins to come out. And you're clothed with power. It's a way for God to empower you. And if you want it, all you have to do is just ask for it. Turn to Luke chapter 11, verse 13. This is what Jesus said, and this is a promise. Luke chapter 11, verse 13. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him. Okay. Mary Magdalene came to the tomb. Hey, that's scripture. Remember what happened on the day of Pentecost. This is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. It was a pouring out of the Spirit of God. 
So every believer has the Holy Spirit. This is not a sermon about the haves and haves not. Every believer has the Holy Spirit, and every believer has access to the power of God. But the baptism is when the Holy Spirit immerses you in himself, and you're filled with a power that flows out of you. Turn to Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8, verse 14. Now, when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent them Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For he had not yet fallen upon any one of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they began laying their hands on them, and they were receiving the Holy Spirit. They were receiving that baptism, that power. Go to Acts chapter 10. Verse 44, we see that the Gentiles are coming in. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who were listening to the message. See, he fell upon them. All the circumcised believers who came with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. For they were hearing them speaking with tongues and exalting God. Then Peter answered, surely no one can refuse the water for these to be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we did, can he? And he ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. See, the Holy Spirit came upon them and they began speaking with tongues and exalting God, not themselves, not the gift. They were exalting God. One more, go to Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19, verse 1. It happened that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the upper country and came to Ephesus and found some disciples. These were believers. And he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said to him, no, we have not even heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And he said, into what then were you baptized? And they said, into John's baptism. Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in him who was coming after him, that is Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when Paul laid his hands upon them, the Holy Spirit came on them and they began speaking with tongues and prophesying. It was a distinct, separate experience apart from salvation that they received. And I know there's a lot of controversy surrounding this topic and surrounding the subject of tongues but I'm going to try to the best of my ability to explain it to you in as simple of a way as possible. And if you want any further resources, there's a lot of good books, but Derek Prince has a great book called The Gifts of the Spirit, and you can read that if you want to. Anybody's welcome to borrow this from me. But I want to talk about tongues in relation to your prayer language and explain what that means. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 10. Paul, he's talking about the gifts of the Spirit, and to another, the effecting of miracles, to another, prophecy, to another, the distinguishing of spirits or the discerning of spirits, to another, various kinds of tongues, and to another, interpretation of tongues. So there's various kinds of tongues, and there's also the interpretation of tongues. So let's talk about the different kinds of tongues, because I think this is where some of the confusion comes in. The first type of tongue, there's, two, two, there's uh, three to four, so depending on how you kind of parse it out. But the first type of tongues, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 14, you're already there. Verse 22, 1 Corinthians 14, verse 22. 
Paul said, so then tongues are for a sign, not to those who believe, but to unbelievers. This was the type of tongue that was released on the day of Pentecost. It was a tongue that did not need interpretation. Everybody just knew the Holy Spirit was given each people group the interpretation of what was being said. So this was, it's, it was for public use. And I actually talked to, uh, we're in a church network called the NRP. You can look it up, n- nrpastors.com. But I've been talking to several pastors since we joined up last year. And I talked to a pastor, Pastor Joe Warner, who's a prophet. We may have him come. But he goes on a lot of mission trip trips. And he was in Guatemala. And a guy was coming in to preach. And he didn't speak Spanish. But the interpreter didn't show up. And the Holy Spirit said... You just get up there. I'm going to give you the words to say. And he got up there and spoke in perfect Spanish and gave the message. Now, this has happened more than one time. He told me a a few other stories. So that's a type of tongue that is public. See, Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, there are various kinds of tongues or different genres of tongues. And so that's public. The second type of tongue that are public is the interpretation of, of tongues, and that's when that is comes under the realm of prophecy, when a person is speaking in tongues and then the interpretation is given either by the same person or by somebody else, and that is a public tongue. Now, we don't let anybody prophesy in this house. Everything's got to go through me because I am the gatekeeper. Prophecy must be tested. Turn to 1 Thessalonians verse 5. 1 Thessalonians verse 5. Look at verse 19. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecies, but test all things. Hold fast what is good. So everything must be tested. Tested, whether it's a prophet that gets up here, there, they have to be tested. We have to know, like Pastor Joe Warner, we know he's a tested prophet. We know he's good. And so we put him in the pulpit, but we have to be careful. And you have to be careful who you let prophesy over you. If somebody comes to you and says, I have a word for you and you don't know them, you need to be cautious. Because bad prophecies can hurt people. I'll tell you a story. I watched, a, a, I watched a movie one time. It was about a bunch of pastors. And uh, it was produced by T.D. Jakes, but this pastor. And it was a bunch of pastors talking about their highs and their lows. And the pastor was talking about his greatest regret. He was in a service. He had had a lady who was sick with cancer and who was terminally ill. And he was doing the service and the Holy Spirit was moving and the pastor looked at the lady and I guess he felt the spirit to such a strong degree. And he looked at the lady and he said, God said, you're going to live and not die. And the whole congregation just erupted in applause. And a month later, she died. It's very serious when we speak. And what we say. If you feel like God, on a personal level, God wants to share, you feel like I want to share something with God. The best thing to say is, I feel the Lord telling me this and you submit it. I'm not big on God said. We need to submit something. But prophecy must be tested before anything is released in the house of God. It's got to be tested. And the time to test something is not once it's spoken. Because words are powerful, and once it goes out there, it's done. So I take that very seriously. My goal is to provide a safe place where we all can experience God together. So tongues and and interpretation, that's public. Now, if you came here... 
In September, when Keith Tusi was here, he would pray for people, he would pray in the spirit, and then he would give a word. So that was a form of tongues with interpretation. I've never done that. But I believe in it, and I've seen it in operation. So those are the two public. Those are public tongues. Now, there's a tongue that is just for you. Go to 1 Corinthians 14, verse 2 says, For one who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God. For no one understands, but in his spirit he speaks mysteries. This is your prayer language. This is what I have been doing since I was eight years old. It's to edify me. It's not for anybody else. It's not to show off. You know, sometimes I hear people pray in the spirit and I think, wow, their prayer language is so awesome. I don't consider my prayer language anything magnificent. But you know what? It's for me. It's not for, it's not, it's not for anybody else. Go, go to verse four. One who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but one who prophesies edifies the church. So tongues, you're speaking mysteries between you and God. Now I want to tell you how powerful this is, and it's why the devil has come against and tried to divide the church with this issue. I mean, it's, it's a very divided issue, but I'm telling you right now, it's very simple. Nothing spooky about it. It's very simple. I'll share my testimony. I would drive with my dad would take me to school, take my brother and I to school. And I would hear him praying in this beautiful language. My dad prayed in the spirit all the time. And I asked my dad, I said, what is that? And he explained to me. And I said, wow, I'd like to do that. He said, son, I'm going to tell you something. I want you to go up in your room and I want you to pray and ask God to give it to you. And I went up in my room. We had bunk beds. I'll never forget. I, I climbed up on that top bed because my brother wanted the bottom bed. And he, he was the oldest one. So, and I prayed and I asked God for it. And I don't remember how it happened. I, I didn't, there wasn't an earthquake. It, it just, all of a sudden I just received this heavenly language. It was, it was just a few words or whatever you want to call it. It's just, it's just a few s syllables. But it was just so simple. And it was so, it just came. You know, children can learn a language a lot faster than an adult can. So I, I, I encourage just pray for your kids, even when they're young, to receive the Holy Spirit, because that's the easiest time. Because as we get older, we begin to get all this doubt, and we see all the things that people say against it, and it just clouds our belief system. But it's important because it's, you're speaking straight to God. It's your spirit to God's spirit. It's like you're speaking the language of heaven. That's what's so powerful. And the devil, guess what? The devil doesn't know what you're saying. Back in World War II, when the, when the Japanese attacked us and we entered the war, the Japanese were very clever. And they had Japanese people that could speak English, so they would intercept our communications, and we'd go someplace, and they'd be right there. And we figured out that they were understanding what we were saying. So then there was a guy who was a Navajo, and he said, hey, I know we can teach these communications officers how to speak Navajo and they can send the, the messages in, in Navajo and the Japanese won't understand what we're saying. And so th that's what they did. And guess what? The war began to turn around. See, the devil wants to come against the praying in the spirit so bad because he knows that we're praying in a heavenly language straight to God. It's bypassing him. It's bypassing all the forces of darkness and he doesn't know what's going on, but it's direct communication, spirit to spirit to God. And I'm telling you, there is great victory in that. And it's simple. It's nothing crazy. It's just praying in a heavenly language that God imparts to the believer. Believers, when you're baptized, when you're clothed in power, and it moves the church forward, it, move, it will move your life forward. It will improve your marriage. 
It will change your kids. It will change your life. It will transform your life. Don't let the devil rob you. That's why I want everybody to pray in the Spirit. Because it's so, it's wonderful. There's been so many times when I have not, I haven't known what to do. And I've gone and I prayed in the spirit, 20, 30 minutes, just getting before God. And then maybe not at that point, but sometime later on the day, all of a sudden God drops the answer right into my heart. So I, I can just tell you time and time and time and time what God has done. Now, Paul writes a long discourse about tongues and about prophecy. And I'll tell you what was happening in the Corinthian church. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And if you understand this, then you'll understand. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. Mm, nice and cold. First Corinthians chapter one. Let's just start at verse four. I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given you in Christ Jesus. Then in everything you were enriched in him in all speech and in all knowledge, even as the testimony concerning Christ was confirmed in you so that you are not lacking in any gift awaiting eagerly the, re the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul never criticized the church for wanting the gifts of the spirit. Never. But in verse 10, this is the heart of the matter. This is why Paul had to write that long discourse on prophecy and on tongues because of this. Now I exhort you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree and that there be no divisions among you, that you be of the same mind, you be complete in the same mind, in the same judgment. For I've been informed concerning you, my brethren, by Chloe's people, that there are quarrels among you. So there was division. He goes on in chapter 11 and reiterates the same thing. People were competing with their spiritual gifts and causing disruption in the service. Again, your prayer language is between you and God. Yes, you can pray in the spirit in the service, but you have to understand you're praying to God. You're not showing off and this was what happened. There was people, they were just trying to show off their gift and it was causing disruption. People were confused. They didn't understand. And there was all kind of, you know, when there's division, there's just chaos. So he never criticized any, uh, any of the gifts. We need the gifts. But it was the division in the church. Now, one more scripture. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17. Here's the heart of the matter when it comes to the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. Now, the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. In other words, when we are in contact, when we allow ourselves to become baptized and filled, there are many infillings. We don't just get baptized once in the Holy Spirit. I mean, it's a continual thing. Ephesians, let's, let's just... Let's just go to two more scriptures and then we're, we're going to close. Turn to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 17 says this, So then do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. That means be continually filled with the Spirit. It's a 
continual process. Jesus said in John chapter 7, out of he who believes in me, out of his inner being will flow rivers of living water. Living water is water that's continually flowing. So it's our job. See, it's my job to keep the well going, to keep the water flowing. That's why I pray in the spirit. Paul said, I pray in the spirit more than all. I wish that you all spoke in tongues. Paul had great revelations. He had such great revelations that he couldn't even write them down. He had great revelations of heaven, and he didn't even write them down. They were so great. And he prayed in the Spirit more than anybody else did. It's, it's a continual thing. All right, go on down to the end of the Bible to Jude. Go to Jude. There's only one chapter. Go to Jude. Verse 20, Jude 20. But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. See, that, that's our command. See, what I do before church is what really matters. I need to be praying in the Holy Spirit before. I mean, now's not the time to sit here and start to pray in the Holy Spirit to get charged up. No, I need to do that before service. If I'm trying to get charged up right now, it's too late. I'm a day late and a dollar short. Building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. It's personal. It's a language that only you and God understand. The enemy doesn't understand. It's not for anybody else. That's what I'm talking about, that's what I have experienced. That's what we have, we have seen is consistent with, with Scripture. That's something that any believer can have. Now, I've never, you know, given a, a tongue and interpretation. I've, I've never done that. Why? Because that's a, that's a gift that's just imparted at that moment. It's just like a gift of healing. You can't manufacture a gift of healing. I mean, it's either going to, somebody's either going to be healed or not. Period. I mean, you can pray, you can believe, but the Holy Spirit does as he wills. See, that's what we need to understand. He does as what he wants to do. So this is that. We're in the last days. We're in the outpouring. We don't have to work it up. We're in it. So I just want to pray for us today.